Hello, it's good to see you. This is Pastor Sam, and I've got a guest star with me. You want to say hi, honey? Hi. Anna is with me today. It's nice to have some family here, too. This devotion is for July 16th. Now, we'll be finishing our look at the judges today. And last time, we began to look at Samson and a little bit of his story. And today, we'll be looking at the end of his story. Samson's going to die. Spoiler. And we'll talk about um, Samson's story. So let's get into it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The reading that we're not going to read, but that I, as always, recommend to you, is from Galatians 4, 12 through 31. And Paul's got some words of concern for his hearers. He's concerned about them and writing to, to kind of, hopefully, try to straighten them out. So, read that. Now, the reading we are going to hear is from Judges 16, and it, it's pretty lengthy. It's like both sides, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. And this is just kind of fortuitous how this happens. Last time we talked about Samson and we said that there were kind of two major things going on in his story. The first was that we're seeing the increasing, not, we are increasingly seeing, that's the way I want to say it, the corruption of man and especially the corruption of those people that the Lord raises up to do his work. So the first part is going to show us that corruption even greater than what we saw last time. Last time Samson had sort of almost married someone and made a bad bet and then killed a bunch of people to satisfy his bet. So that was kind of bad. We're seeing the increasing, we are increasingly seeing the corruption even of God's people. And then in the second part, the, the second thing that I said is that <clears throat> in spite of this, God still gets done what he promised to do. So I'm going to break it up into those two pieces, and it just kind of works that way, that the first part of our reading talks about the corruption, and the second part of our reading talks about God doing his thing. So we're going to do that. Judges 16, 4 through 22 is the first half. After this, Samson loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him, and see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him, and we will each give you eleven hundred pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies, and how you might be bound, that one could subdue you. Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in ambush in an inner chamber. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings, as a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me with new, new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber. But he snapped the ropes off his arms like a thread. Honey, can you be a little bit quieter, please? Thank you. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, 
Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web. And she made them tight with the pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, the loom, and the web. And she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man and had him sit, shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out, as at other times, and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in, in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. What I want to really focus on this time is the how we increasingly see the corruption even of God's people. Now I've said this, I think, in just about every devotion, so I'll say it again for completion's sake. As we go through the book of Judges, the stories are becoming lengthier and more tragic. And what I mean by that, our first judge, Othniel, his story is something like five or six verses long. Israel was oppressed. They cried out to God. God raised up Othniel. He killed a bunch of dudes. Israel was good. Like, that's basically it. But as we go through our judges, we are seeing... Oh, Anna just wants to say hi. We are seeing really their humanity coming through more and more. So think about last time, our last devotion, we heard Samson. He was going to marry this girl, and everything would have been good, but he kind of plays around with his enemies. He's marrying a Philistine girl who... Do we have... Okay, so I don't want to get super political in this, but that would be like you marrying someone from the Taliban, right? That's that's kind of... Now that's sort of gone off our radar a little bit, but, but that's kind of what it's like, right? L marrying someone who is only an enemy, right? It would it'd be like, that's crazy. What are you doing? But he wants to marry this girl who is his enemy, and he makes this bet. So he's kind of toying with his enemies and gives them a riddle. And if they can solve his riddle, he's going to give them a bunch of stuff. If they can't solve his riddle, then they have to give him a bunch of stuff. And it, it's it's a weird riddle. And so eventually the the uh, future wife, the fiance, I don't know what to call her exactly, gets Samson to reveal the answer to the riddle. She tells it to the Philistines and they, of course, get the riddle. Right. Now in this one, we're seeing sort of a, a, a heightening and expanding of this. You can really see in this story the same the same thread running throughout it, right? Samson falls in love with this girl, and last time the girl was was fine, I guess, but this time the girl is no good, right? She is actively trying to destroy him, basically. And, and Samson is, I guess I'll just say he's very proud, very sure of himself, because he's, okay, let, let me just read what she says to him. Uh, in verse 6, Please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. Like, what possible scenario would he tell her something like that? Basically, I want to bind you and make you a prisoner. Tell me how I can do this. Like, that's insane. Someone who says that they love you wouldn't say something like that. But here's that corruption of man, Samson is toying with his prey. So three times 
he he lies to her, right? He lies to her. But we're we're getting closer to the truth. So the first time bowstrings, you know, the first two are kind of tying his hands. The third one, the the third one, I'm gonna try not to uh, have a bad finger up. The third one, he is it talking about his hair, and that's really where his strength lies. And Samson does say that if we had read beforehand, like the way beginning, he was a Nazarite, which is a vow that any uh, Israelite person could take. And basically, you would not shave your head and you would not drink wine or alcohol or that kind of thing. For context, John the Baptist took this same, I think he did, took this same vow of being a Nazarite. I'm pretty sure about that. But anyway, uh, and, and that was kind of the promise given to Samson, that if he never shaves his head, if he keeps his vow to the Lord, then he will have this amazing strength. And so the third time, he's kind of pointing her in the right direction. Now, he still lies to her because he says, if you kind of tie my hair in a loom, like get it stuck in a sewing machine to kind of modernize it, then I will become weak. And so she does it. She does it each of these three times. And he's still, he's still toying with his prey. He still thinks that he can get out of trouble, basically. And he, he does it three times. He gets out of trouble each of the three times. He snaps the strings. He pulls the whole loom apart and, and gets free. But then the fourth time, and I this is just like such... Uh, a great description. Where is it? Okay, verse 16. And she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him. His soul was vexed to death. He just stays in this terrible situation because Samson thinks that he can get out of it, right? He thinks he's clever enough, he's strong enough, he's proud enough to be able to get out of what is obviously a terrible situation this girl is trying to destroy you like dude just leave and well eventually it it kind of all catches up with him she or i guess she has somebody come in and shave his head and his strength now notice notice what it says uh, okay the end of verse 19 after the head is shaved then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. So his strength leaves him, right? His head is shaved. His strength leaves him, and the Lord leaves him. Because now Samson has broken the vow that he has made to the Lord, and so the Lord will in turn break. No, I don't want to say that. The Lord will fulfill the consequences which he has promised. That's the way I want to say it. So the vow was, as long as your head is unshaved, I'll be with you. You'll have great strength, right? So as soon as his head is shaved, Samson has broken the vow and the Lord fulfills the requirements of the broken vow. Basically, his strength is gone and the Lord leaves him, right? So we're seeing this incredibly tragic figure. And I think it really speaks to to just humanity. Like we 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 dance around with these dumb things all the time, trying to kind of, oh, I you know, I can like I can I can tiptoe up to the line of whatever, whatever name your pet sin is, that thing that you always do. I can I can crawl right up to the line, but I'm not gonna jump over. And then you kind of dance on the line and, and eventually, I mean you just like jump headlong across it, right? And we do this all the time. All the time all the time we do these dumb stupid things that's just yeah, the increasing increasingly seeing the corruption of man but in spite of this here's where the second half of our reading comes in god still gets done what he's promised to do so here we go not right now we'll do it after devotion hunt verse 23 now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, Our god has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their god. For they said, 
Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they, call, they said, Call Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof there were about three thousand men and women, who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me, and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. I want to give a little bit of background information because it helps to understand what's going on. Now, in ancient Near Eastern belief, the, the nations would have usually several gods, kind of a whole, like, uh, buffet of gods. there, And each god had a principal thing that they were interested in. So think if you've studied Egypt, right, there's the sun god and there's the god of the Nile and there's the fertility god and there's the god of the house. There's, there's all these gods and they've all got their thing. But there's usually a principal god who's kind of in charge of all of them. And what would happen is the people the people had their, their main god and then their kind of sub-gods. And whenever they would fight, the war was basically, my nation's god is fighting against your nation's god, and whichever god is stronger is going to show they're stronger by giving victory. So if, if, if nation over here beats nation over there, then this god is obviously stronger. Because he was able to defeat the other god because his, his people, his worshipers, killed the other worshipers. Now, where, what we see in this is the Philistines are thinking that their god, Dagon, is mightier than the Lord. I'm going to call our Christian god the Lord to hopefully avoid confusion. That Dagon is mightier than the Lord. Well, now this is a problem because nothing is mightier than the Lord. That was like the whole... Uh, first half of Exodus is just proving that the Lord is mightier than all of the Egyptian gods, right? So the people have this faulty idea because Samson was kind of subdued and bound and eyes gouged out, he, it, which was a way to kind of symbolically render him powerless, right? The, the gouging of the eyes. Because Samson has been given to us, our god Dagon must be mightier than the Lord, and, and, and that's like the main, one of the main things that the Lord can't stand is people thinking that anything is, is mightier or better or more powerful or whatever than he is. That's like, I mean, that's first commandment stuff, right? So the Lord is going to fulfill his promise to his people. He's going to give them victory over their enemies. Now, I see in Samson's death, a, a bit of Christ-likeness. I see a bit of it. Now, you have to kind of put off the what I said in the first half, all that corruption, right? Because that doesn't correspond to Christ. But here's what I mean by that. Through self-sacrifice, through the death of self, Samson is killing all of these enemies and giving his people victory. And even, what did it say in there? He bowed with all his strength, right? That phrase, and I'm not saying that it corresponds, it, it reminds me that that's about as strong of a connection as I want to state. It reminds me of Jesus bowing his head and breathing out his spirit and dying that way, right? And in Christ's death upon the cross, he defeats all of our enemies. There, so there, there's a bit of kind of correspondence, corresponding between those two events. But 
with Samson's life, he finally does what the Lord has called him to do. He gives victory over the the Philistines, the, the people's enemies. And it says, the last verse, the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. So finally, Samson is humbled. He's done toying with his prey, and he's at last ready to focus on doing what the Lord has asked him to do. And he provides victory over the people's enemies, now at the cost of his own life. He's a very fitting end to the book of Judges. He is, I'm pretty sure he's the last judge. Pretty sure he's the last judge. But we'll be getting into, I mean, just kind of biblical history, into Samuel, the first prophet. We'll be kind of getting into the kings. So the the nation of Israel is going to transition into having their own kings. And the the kings have kind of a similar tragic history where there's a few good ones, there's a lot of bad ones, right? But in Samson's story, we see what we've been seeing throughout the whole book of Judges. The corruption of man becomes increasingly stronger. First of all, in the judges, in, in the people who God uses to do what he wants, who should be doing good things. We see increasingly their corruption. And also, just within the general people. Every time God gives them victory, there's a little period of peace, but then the people return to doing evil in the sight of the Lord, and they get right back in trouble. And we also see the Lord fulfilling his promises. Now, I, I haven't said this for a few devotions, so I'll bring it back. Again, the Lord kind of has two promises that he's keeping. The people are going to live in the promised land. And if the people listen to him, things are good. If they don't, things are bad. So when they listen to him, like when the judges do their work and the people follow the Lord, things are good. Things work out. When the people don't listen to God, then God God is not really stuck, but he's fulfilling both of these promises. So they get to stay in the land. But their enemies come in, overpower them, enslave them, take their food. Things are just bad, right? And, and I think I, I want to kind of bring this forward to us that in spite of our corruption, and, and boy, we are corrupt people. Like, think about that pet sin that you just rush headlong into time and time again. Uh, same thing for me, right? In spite of that, God still accomplishes his promises. His promise to love us, his promise to protect us, to care for us. Now, bad things do happen to us, and, and deservedly so. I'll just say that, right? Uh, we, we make dumb choices, and we receive the consequences of those dumb choices. But God is still watching over us. God is still caring for us. And we have to look long-term to see where all of this is headed in the day of Christ's return. God will raise us up from the dead. He will come and dwell with us. He will make all things new. And so there won't be any more stupid choices to make. There won't be any more enemies. There won't be any more sickness or any of that garbage, right? Things will just only be good. And, and looking long-term, we can see God keeping his promises. That's it. We're done with the book of Judges. Now, I don't know, going forward, where exactly we'll go. We might bounce around a little bit between Old Testament and New Testament. You'll just have to come back next time and see. But we're going to pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, 
my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's good to see you. Anna, you want to say bye-bye? Bye. All right, there you go. Hope you heard that. God's peace be with you.